Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Ray Lin, class of 1984, and welcome to the Reunion Weekend 2019 at Columbia Law School. I'm in, thank you. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this opportunity as I am to get together with my fellow classmates and my fellow alumni to celebrate our reunions. Uh, it should be a terrific day. So hearing from the Dean is a great tradition of reunion weekend. It is my honor to introduce Dean Jillian Lester, who will have a conversation with our fellow graduate, Mary Jo White, from the class of 1974. I'm sure this conversation will give us a good sense of Columbia Law School. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a good sense of Columbia Law School today and remind us of the great impact that we, as graduates of this law school, have on the legal landscape. First, let me start with the introductions. Uh, Jillian Lester is the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Law and the 15th Dean of Columbia Law School. She is a nationally recognized authority on employment law and policy. Her research focuses on exploring workplace intellectual property law, public finance policy, and the design of social insurance laws and regulations. She is the author of numerous books and articles and co-authors one of the leading case books on employment law. Dean Lester began her teaching career in 1994 at the UCLA School of Law, where she spent 12 years as a professor before joining the Berkeley Law Faculty, where in addition to serving as acting dean, she also co-directed the Berkeley Center for Health, Economic, and Family Security and was the Associate Dean for the JD Program and Cur Curricular Planning. Dean Lester's held external appointments across the country and the world, including Harvard Law School as a Sidley Austin visiting professor, and at the Georgetown University Law Center as a Sloan Fellow and visiting professor, and has had visiting appointments at the USC Gould School of Law, University of Chicago Law School, and the Radzenier School of Law Interdisciplinary Center in Israel. Dean Lester holds degrees from Stanford Law School and the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, where she served as Editor-in-Chief of the Law Review. Dean Lester's new initiatives continue to provide the foundation for ongoing growth of original ideas, unique opportunities, and vigorous scholarship that together define Columbia's future. I want to add, this past year, she has continued to travel across the world multiple times to engage with our alumni community and encourage you to come back to campus so it's so wonderful to have so many of you from near and far with us this weekend. It's also wonderful to have Mary Jo White with us. Mary Jo is a litigation partner in the New York office of Deborah Boyce and Plimpton where, and a senior chair of the firm. She's also a leader of the firm's Strategic Crisis Response and Solutions Group, and her practice focuses on counseling boards of directors and representing clients on significant and sensitive matters. Prior to rejoining the firm in 2017, Mary Jo, nominated by President Obama, served as the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Under her leadership, the SEC strengthened protections for investors and the markets through transformative rulemakings that addressed major issues raised by the financial crisis and created the framework for the future regulation of the asset management industry. Mary Jo was also the first and only woman to have served as the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, where she was noted for, among other things, the prosecution of John Gotti. Mary Jo has been an active and engaged Columbia Law School graduate. She is an emeritus member of the Board of Visitors, former chair of the Annual Fund Committee, and has served on reunion committees. Thank you, Mary Jo, uh, for all your work for Columbia. She was also the recipient of the Columbia Law School Medal for Ex Excellence the law school's highest honor. Congratulations, Mary Jo, on your 45th reunion. With that, <laughs> with that, please welcome Dean Jillian Lester and Mary Jo White, class of 1974. Uh, thank you so much, Ray, and uh, congratulations to you on your 35th reunion. There you go. Uh, before we begin, uh, Mary Jo, I'd just like to uh, take a moment to uh, to acknowledge uh, the others here in the room. I'm going to have a lot to to to, uh, to talk about with you. We have uh, over 1,300 celebrants at our reunion this weekend. That's a record. Uh, that's 
more than 30% 30, 30 more than uh, five years ago when this group of celebrants came together for their reunion. So uh, something's, something exciting is happening. And uh, there are a couple of classes in particular that have very, very strong attendance. The, uh, the 15th, 20th, and 50th, you know who you are. We also have people who have come to Columbia from 37 countries this weekend, which I also find just remarkable that with, uh, with the diaspora of Columbia alumni, you, you, you continue to come home year after year and, uh, and, and maintain a, a place in your life for Columbia Law School. I, I also want to say that your generosity has been just incredible. We've had some, in leading up to the reunion, uh, the, 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 the chairs and co-chairs of the reunion committees do a couple of different things. They, they reach out to, to, long, uh, to, to longtime friends and welcome them to Columbia to join in the celebration. But they also invite you to give to the school. And I want to say thank you so much for the incredible generosity with which you have indeed given. Just in the period leading up to the reunion, we have another month before the end of the fiscal year, we've, we've raised more than nine and a half million dollars in, in association <laughs> with the reunion. And I'm going to just shout out a couple of classes, uh, classes of 59 and 69 had the two highest rates of participation. That means just any little bit counts. Lots of people participated. And the highest level of giving was 2.3 million from the class of 1974, with the runner-up being the class of 1989 with 2 million. So really, really amazing, really amazing. So a big thanks to all of you, and especially to the, uh, the co-chairs Who've, uh, who've worked so hard to make this a terrific weekend and, uh, and a great fundraising effort. So Mary Jo, thank you. Uh, thank you. So much for joining us today for this conversation and, uh, and be for being here for your 45th reunion. Uh, so Ray talked a little bit about your amazing career. You've, you've had an interesting pattern of, uh, of, of going back and forth between the Debevoise firm uh, as, a, as a litigator, uh, now, uh, Partner and uh, I guess uh, the I told them not to call chair. me the senior chair. Senior but chair. They did right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very impressive. Yes. Uh, or I'm old, sure, one sure or the other, right? You know, got to figure that out. So, right. uh, but you know, it, it's been an interesting pattern in that you know you started out after you know graduated top of your class uh, in, uh, in in seventy four, clerked, uh, went to Debevoise Voice and cut your teeth for a couple of years, and then. Off to the U.S. Attorney's Office, off to the Southern District, right. and then um, and then uh, where you you know where you became a, a head of the criminal group there, and then you came you went back to Debevoise. Voice. Six times. Just six so six <laughs> times. But who's, but who's counting? Who's but who's counting? counting? Some people uh, call it the attention span of a five-year-old, as opposed <laughs> to you know. But okay. And, and of course, as Ray, as Ray noted, each time uh, when you went back into public service, you had greater and greater responsibility and public trust uh, in you with uh, uh, first as the U.S. attorney, uh, and then, of course, later as a member of, um, as a commissioner with the SEC, and of course, four years as, as, the, as the chair. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really just honored to be sharing the stage with you, and uh, we all at Columbia are incredibly proud to, Thank by you. affinity, yeah. uh, um, 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 be part of the same community. So, uh, so um, what I really always wanted to be, though, is commissioner of baseball. So just so <laughs> before we get carried away with all these legal things, all right, you know. And if you know anyone, I'm still actually uh, open to that possibility. Sorry, sorry. Just I just never lose the opportunity. You know, you never know who knows who in a room, right? You know. So okay. Uh, well, it's been it's been great also that you've kept coming back to the school and you've watched us evolve yeah. over time. It's a great, look, it's, it's terrific. It really is terrific, yeah, to be back. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it got us all started in such a, you know, tremendous way. And you, know, you get asked sort of, uh, you know, what's it meant to you to, you know, go to Columbia Law School? And it's really hard to, I've always said, at least for me, hard to put your finger on, but you, you really do remain very grateful. And somehow it happened to serve you in a way that sort of just sticks with you. I don't know whether it's teaching you how to think or to be, Independent, the word that's usually applied to me, sometimes pejoratively, sometimes not. But I <laughs> give Columbia some, you know, credit for that. And I don't know if it's this room; they're all redecorated and they look great. And it's, you know, but uh, Herb Wexler, I think, and you know, I remember, you know, from federal courts and Harvey Goldschmidt. I mean, you go on and on and on with just, just, you know, kind of the titans of the legal profession. And so it's just a 
it's really terrific, terrific to be back. I mean, you know, if I was, as I think with my introduction, I, I was, I did serve for a while on the uh, the board of visitors, so I sort of kept up with uh, you know all the great, great changes you know since we were here in '74 for a while, and then I got to Washington. Then you keep up with nothing, right? You're just sort of fending off the the world a little bit. Uh, but um, you know, be very interested in just your thoughts about how different it is now than at least for my class at 74. Yeah, you know, um, when we were talking about your career. If it is, right, yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, the fundamentals remain that, you know, that at the heart of our mission is to train just the very, very best lawyers, train, a, a, you know, the, each generation of people who are going to be practicing at the top of their field and, and who are going to become leaders in the field. But one thing I'll say that, um, that is a, an aspiration, and we've built a curriculum around it, is to, is to graduate uh, professionals who can have careers like you've had, moving between sectors and spheres in a way that you know, enables really higher kinds of leadership. So uh, being able to, to, to perform in the proving ground of, of practice within private law firms or public law, uh, public law settings, but then in addition, being able to move into public service, being able yeah. to move into business, being able to move um, in-house. And some of the things that we've tried to put together in order to make that possible are um, in very, very intentional, very deliberate. Uh, interdisciplinarity in the curriculum so that students while learning law here at Columbia are also uh, having exposure to and taking classes in business, journalism, data science, and so forth. Leadership, we teach it quite explicitly. We've, we've developed a curriculum around leadership, uh, Davis Polk Leadership Initiative, and it's uh, both, it's curricular, it also involves mentoring, it involves scholarship. Uh, global engagement, that's not new. Uh, we've always right. been, right. Uh, we've always distinguished ourselves among our peers, but. But, but it really, but we, it has changed a lot, I think. I mean, and, and again, I was more current a couple of years ago than, than now, but. You know, the, I think the emphasis on public service, interdisciplinary, you know, uh, course offerings and all that. I mean, I think, and others in my class who are here uh, will correct me if I'm wrong on this. I mean, I think in our era, um, you know, I think it was just sort of assumed that, you know, you'd kind of, most of us would uh, you know, get a great education here, uh, we'd, you know, get a good summer associate job, then go to a law firm, and then, and then, and then what? And, and I must say, and I was, you know, I never get invited back twice because of what I'm about to say, but um, <laughs> I thought law school was a year too long, actually, in my era, because by the time we'd finished the, you know, the first two, which were great courses, I mean, I, and I come back to what I said in the beginning, just an enormously uh, invaluable grounding for everything thereafter. But then it was a little tougher to kind of figure out, you know, yeah. and what you have now is just by no comparison. I mean, whether it's clinical programs or it's, Internships, you know, in the public yeah. sector. I mean, it's hugely different. Yeah, I mean, students in a great way. Actually, often yeah. say they feel even if even if by the time they get to their third year, they sort of know that they, where they're probably going to be going, or they might have a job secured. Right. They they often express the view that there's not enough time, even in the three years, yeah, because yeah, exactly. really what we're trying to do. I think the key thing is we're trying to create versatile professionals. It's versatility, and that involves a versatile an education that's almost like a a liberal law education, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. counterpart to a liberal yeah, arts absolutely. education, uh, and we work very hard to be able to do that. Um, but let's 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 talk about you. Uh, I want to dive in. Uh, you've been, and somehow you continue to be in the eye of the storm all the time. You seem to uh, find yourself in some of the most complex. That's why I'm and, leaving after here uh, to go somewhere. In a good way. Well, sometimes in a good way. Yes, yeah, sometimes in a good way. Uh, but but seriously, you, you've 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 had the, um, you know, you've been chosen to 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 engage with to try to solve some of the most complex and contentious problems uh, facing our society. Even um, you know, so just as an example, uh, the Me Too hashtag Me Too movement um, last fall, uh, after twelve women told the New Yorker uh, that the chief executive of CBS, uh, Leslie Moonves, uh, had sexually harassed and assaulted them. The CBS board retained uh, both Debo Voice and you to co-lead uh, uh, a headline-grabbing investigation into, uh, you know, the veracity of the allegations. So uh, let me just open this up. 
What have you learned from being involved with uh, Me Too litigation? Let's see, how long do we have? Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, well, first let me say that it, this is actually, was a surprising part of my docket when I came back in uh, early 2017 to private practice from the SEC. I mean, I've always done internal investigations of all kinds of things, you know, arcane accounting rules, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, criminal uh, law violations, FCPA, you know, the, the whole gamut. But this was not something that I'd done much of, some of, some of. But certainly the Me Too movement really, you know, and, and as it's at least uh, uh, dated now, really didn't start until, you know, uh, more, more recently or didn't start again until more recently. And so I've done quite a number of, for, you know, various uh, educational institutions as well as, you know, uh, large public companies and private companies, Me Too investigations. Um, you know, the, in many ways they're the, they're the same. It's a, it's a crisis typically. Of, uh, and, but in many ways they're, they at least magnify, I think, all the issues you have in sensitive internal investigations. Um, they are, for example, one of the sort of things in the internal investigations playbook, if I can say it that way, uh, that you at least consider if the allegations are against a CEO or a senior executive, whatever the nature of the allegations are, you handle it differently in a company, right? I mean, you, you basically can't have the, or shouldn't have probably, the, an, an inside, uh, you know, the, the legal department handle that because it's, the CEO, you go outside to a firm, but even more than that, you probably have the board overseeing that kind of investigation. All of these Me Too investigations, certainly involving senior executives, fall into that mold. And then, and then you know, there's another kind of big issue you face in, in most of these investigations. Do you do a public report of what your findings are? Again, whatever the subject matter is. My own bias in general is not to do public reports. You put a statement out of findings and and what your remediation is, but you don't put out um, a, a large, you know, detailed but, report. Sometimes you need to. But one of the things about Me Too, I yeah. mean, at the very, but, yeah. in the very DNA of the Me Too movement is this idea that yeah. people who've exactly. been victims of abuse are supposed to speak up and speak out, and they want, they want yeah. to know yeah. Yeah. No, what I was, happened. And that's how, that's one where, place where it's very different because, you know, I th and again, you have options, and if you're a company or an educational institution about what you do and reporting, but part of remediating in the Me Too space, much more so I think than other spaces, is the public accountability. And yeah. so you have that, you know, pressure there. You've also got, I think, the, you know, I mean, the, the, the best part of the Me Too movement in my mind, and I hope this remains my view in a while, is that I think it actually has raised the bar of behavior in the workplace and continues to do that. A challenge as an investigator or an institution, though, is um, if you make a, a, what I'm going to call a more measured finding in a particular s investigation, uh, the person didn't do it, person did it, but, you know, didn't do, at least uh, per the, wor the worst allegations, how do you get proportionality if you do it all in this space in terms of both what you do with the employee, what you do with the executive, you know, can any CEO survive really even an allegation that, uh, even if there's exoneration, it, it becomes a challenge, I think. And so I forget, it was a law professor, but I forget who, uh, put out an op-ed maybe about a year ago saying, you know, we need to get the proportionality back in this. And it's, but it's a, it's a very, I mean, many internal investigations are very painful, and so are the people involved, even if it's about some esoteric accounting violation. But in this space, uh, I mean, they're real victims, you know, who have suffered uh, just grievously. Um, you know, and it, again, the conduct ranges, ranges right, from the worst you can imagine to still totally unacceptable. And so having to you know, try to do the best you can in terms of the victims of the abuse, but still be very fair to whoever you're investigating. It's, it's quite a, uh, you know, I, I think of a higher order challenge than most other kinds of investigations. You talk about proportionality. Do you think it's a matter of time that, that there will be a kind of a equilibration or do you think it's something that lawyers and the way they handle investigations? Well, or, I, I, or do you think it's just the yeah. nature of the subject matter? I think, that you, first, as the lawyer and the investigator, you have to be prepared always to be criticized for whatever you find and whatever you Fair say enough. and whatever you recommend. <laughs> I mean, that's just if you don't want, want that, don't do any kind of internal investigation, frankly, of any you know, controversial or important uh, nature. But yeah, I think, so first, I think the responsibility to do this, do these investigations and every other kind does rest with the lawyers 
and I think you need to be very thoughtful about what you're recommending that the company do. Um, it's harder in this kind of space. You want to make sure your lawyer has the expertise in this space to do that. But, but you can't be afraid to sort of speak out and say, not every case is the death penalty. Uh, will we ever get to the spot in the Me Too space where is there such a thing as rehabilitation? Should there be such a thing as rehabilitation? I mean, I mean, some of this is also, I think now, you know, correcting for decades, centuries of unacceptable, highly unacceptable conduct in the workplace. So, you know, you, what you don't want to lose in the in the Me Too movement is that continued pressure for you know that kind of positive change. But but you you know you never want to lose sight of. Did it happen? To what degree did it happen? What's the appropriate remediation? But expect to take it in the neck, uh, you know, no matter what you find, and particularly when you're putting up a hand some, sometimes for, well, hopefully all times, for proportionality as to what should happen. So um, another, uh, another situation where there was crisis and you were called in is, um, you know, you were, you were chair of the SEC during a, the aftermath of the financial crisis, and there was there was a lot uh, there were a lot of thorny things to solve uh, uh, concerns about transparency and regulation uh, of securities markets were at a high point, really at a high a, a high. Speaking of things right. that you know have, have uh, were at a peak moment, and you oversaw the enforcement of a lot of new regulations to protect investors and the markets, and uh, and you know. Some of the really big companies, uh, you know, unicorns like Facebook, so-called unicorns, Google, Uber, Amazon, Tesla, um, you know, were affected. A time when these were it right. companies, uh, there was also a boom coming down of right. trying to have transparency and, uh, and regulatory oversight. So what were some of the biggest challenges you saw in trying to, uh, in trying to corral? I mean, I think the area that I think your entities. question is at least suggesting to me, I mean, during my tenure at the SEC, I was there from 2013 to 2017, a lot of what we did in the regulatory space, maybe more than I would have liked, was really mandated by Congress. And some of that was good uh, under the Dodd-Frank Act and the Jobs Act. And a, a challenge was sort of finding that space and bandwidth to do things that you thought ought to be done for investors and the markets. But what, what did it was occurring during my tenure, and it's not continuing and preceded me as well, um, are really the, what is the SEC's role, if any, or, or much, uh, with respect to, you know, private companies and unicorns and the startups and the, yeah. and so I, I remember in 2016, uh, Joe Grunfest, if you know him, is a former SEC commissioner and heads the Rock Center, Governance Center at Stanford Law mm -hmm. School, um, invited me out there. Again, he will probably not invite me back either because I came out there as chair of the SEC and talked about so the SEC does have a role in, for the unicorns and for the startup companies and for innovative companies, even when they're not public yet. And the point I was making there was, one is the obvious, that obviously, even if you're not a public company subject to the, I'll call it jurisdiction of the SEC, um, you still, you know, 10b-5 applies and you can't, you know, lie to your investors and commit securities fraud, so that's always applicable. And then the other part of what I was saying is the SEC is really kind of watching you know, uh, the private companies, the unicorns, but, but beyond the unicorns, even before they become public. I was also in an era, you know, it's getting a bit better where companies, a bit better, I mean, that may be more uh, normative and judgmental than I meant, where the companies, large companies stay private much longer um, and therefore are not subject to some of these transparency rules. And they can and, get a little freewheeling. Yeah, they can and get a little freewheeling. And some of the CEOs can get, you know, well, almost kind of celebrity I'm, I'm going to make a status. point about Telsa in a second because that happened after my, <laughs> my tenure because that was a public company that when it's gotten all of the, the attention it has. But, but the point I was making to this audience was also if you're, as you're preparing to go public, you know, know what that means when you go public. I mean, some of it is maybe, you know, painful and uh, you'd rather not have some uh, you know, regulations that may be onerous and stifle some things you'd like to do before. But some CEOs, particularly entrepreneurial CEOs, you know, they've never been a CEO of a public company. So first of all, you've got to know that if the, your CEO happens to be you know, your entrepreneur when, when you go public. And then you're going to need you know, robust, you ought to have it as a private company too, but internal control systems. Uh, and also you need a governance structure that you're going to have to have when you become public. Very many of the private companies, when they go public, not all of them, aren't really prepared to be a public company. And so they can get into some 
very early trouble on, you know, on the SEC front. Um, Telso, the only thing I'll say about that is, and again, this is from the outside, I don't you know, have any, any inside information on this, uh, but watching from the outside my old agency, and you know, my background is enforcement, so I did quite a bit at the SEC in enforcement. I'm sort of watching the enforcement action they brought in that space against Telsa and the and the CEO, really over a social media, you know, communication that uh, the SEC at least charged was uh, was not true, and then trying to sort of balance sending a very strong message to the markets and CEOs uh, of what's important in the way of transparency and accuracy when you're speaking to the markets, uh, but without harming that company by being too tough with that CEO. And so they were trying yeah. to balance, you know, their remedies. And, and some of the remedies were quite creative. I mean, having social media communications, you know, kind of overseen by somebody, whether the board or somebody else. Um, and, but, but yet not taking the CEO out. I mean, uh, you, the SEC does have bar powers, so they could have thought about doing that. Uh, and then watching it after that. So it was, it was quite, they did it very quickly. I thought it was impressive, uh, you know, from the outside again. Uh, as a former, uh, you know, uh, chairman of the SEC and overseeing the enforcement program. And then you saw it continue. Uh, the challenge for them right. continued when it was sort of like, you know, like this, right, to the SEC. What do you do about that then? Yeah. And it's still playing out. So it's a, so, the, so that shows you some of the, the, the tensions. And the SEC has got to worry about its own credibility. And, it, you know, at some point, you know, you have to say, and I'm not talking about this case in particular at all, but you have to kind of say, Look, there is going to be some harm from this, but rather than to undermine the entire, you know, sort of system of laws that apply to everybody else, we've got to be tougher than we'd like, and there's going to be some harm. But I, you know, so that's a that's an example of I think uh, kind of the new age of having to deal with uh, SEC regulation for companies that that go, you know, go public in that space. Yeah, and sometimes uh, some of those companies, the startups that these so-called yep. unicorns, they, they, you know, they're they're sometimes driven by. Uh, Talent as well as charismatic personalities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you absolutely. know, they, they get them to be the the company that is right. the, the focus of attention and, and part of their success. And those charismatic personalities sometimes don't adjust to the right. the more staid the more staid existence of a public company. Uh, no, no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> little, and that's a, uh, so you've got you know, and look, you don't you don't want a square it, hole and, problem. And, you know, if you're the SEC, you also don't want to. And this is in other spaces too. They're facing it now in the. I'll call it the cryptocurrency space. I mean, you don't want to stifle yeah. innovation, yeah. but you sure don't want investors harmed and the markets harmed either. Yeah. And you know, because I think the strength of our market still is their integrity and transparency. So, uh, antitrust, I know, is not is not the agency you were associated with, but but some was of was our... my favorite course at Columbia, though. Ah, well, good to know. Uh... And then, by the way, to show you how useful that was, it was my favorite course. I think I have had one antitrust problem since then. That's in forty five <laughs> years now, but it was my favorite my favorite course. Harvey Goldsmith, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, 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 like, <laughs> I, I can't, I can't resist asking in any event yeah. uh, because a couple of uh, the scholars here at, at Columbia have been focused. Tim Wu, uh, uh, yeah. and we also made an offer to a, um, an entry level person whose name is Lena Khan, and I hope she joins us. Have been writing about bigness uh, yeah. of these companies, and uh, and you know that the, the argument yeah. is yeah. that. Antitrust uh, enforcement ought to be, you know, more sensitive to the, you know, the bigness of companies like Amazon uh, that seem to be taking over everything. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, you know, like my reaction, and I'm not an antitrust lawyer. Yeah. I <sighs> maybe wish I were, but I probably won't be now. Baseball commissioner, though, still plenty, <laughs> still <laughs> plenty of runway for that. Um, but I think so. I'm not. So I sort of approach that this issue and the, the bigness of it tech companies particularly, from more of a securities lawyer perspective. Yeah. And so I'm more concerned about they're following the rules and, you know, in, in, in that space uh, and others. I'm a capitalist at heart, which didn't warm the hearts of every uh, senator from Massachusetts I can remember But uh, when I was the SEC. <laughs> but I am a, I don't, it should remain unnamed, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I am a capitalist at heart. And so when I focus on those issues to the extent that I do, I'm more concerned, I mean, obviously, if there's an antitrust violation from their bigness or their use of monopoly power and so forth, you know, clearly, I do think one should, you know, proceed you know, to, to remedy that. Um, what I think is also being discussed in that space that I do agree with, though, and that you mentioned Amazon, is that I think when you get big companies and then you also have the government subsidizing those big companies, that, I think, is very troubling. 
but I don't know that I would say, okay, we got to, in fact, I wouldn't say, we need a statute to say, here's, here's how big you can be, right. uh, because we don't want to stifle innovation. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm certainly old enough to remember, I think some of us complained for about 10 years when AT&T was broken up, that our phones were like, you know, yeah. Not, this totally non-functional. This, this doesn't right? work anymore. Yeah, so I don't, you know, so so I wouldn't do that for that that reason. But I certainly would enforce all the rules, you know, that that are out there. And I wouldn't help the bigness. I wouldn't have government help the bigness. I think is how I sort of look at that. Uh, so we've touched on a couple of areas where you've been in the heat of controversy, and uh, and you've had a, a you know a distinguished career of being called in in situations like this. And I guess. Uh, I'm sure many people here are just interested to hear what lessons you've learned uh, um, about leadership, about lawyering, in, in you know, being in these uh, kind of heat yeah. of the moment uh, kinds of situations. Yeah, I mean, career. you know, I, I, I must like those situations <laughs> because, you know, that's what I, you know, I mostly do. And sometimes you sit there and you think, oh, do I really want all this stress? Where's the softball? Where's the softball? Would anybody hire me for a softball? I mean, you know, please hire me for a softball. <laughs> You know, uh, but 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 frankly, I mean, it, it does come back to Columbia, I think, because what I love about the law, I always have, is is the problem solving. The harder it is, the better I, you know, the more engaged I, you know, that I get in that. In ter and so, and I think in terms of leadership in those, I mean, the quality that I keep coming back to that I think has been, that I, I a I value in everybody, and I think is I hope, and I think I have some of it, uh, and has been most important to me is my independence. Um, so that, um, you know, whatever, you know, slings and arrows you get, you still have got to say, okay, you got to be clear eyed and here is what you think the right thing to do is here. There's one, you know, sort of vignette I use sometimes, and I think I may have used it at the Columbia commencement I gave not too long ago from Archibald Cox, who says one of the problems with lawyers and probably he said from the seventies forward, but maybe still so is that you get too mired in you know, advising clients of, yes, you can do this, no, you can't do this, and you don't back up and say, but you really shouldn't do that, or, or deal with yeah. the bigger questions. Yeah. And I think that's easier said than done a lot of times when some CEO wants to do X and you say, yes, you can, but they really don't want to hear from you, you're, not, you're the lawyer. But I think the lawyers, I think we lawyers have more of a responsibility sometimes than we shoulder in terms of advising clients and, and sort of speaking out on issues. You know, leadership, I mean, I, sometimes I get asked, I mean, you know, I've been a head of a couple of agencies and, and had some leadership positions in the law firm. I don't know, uh, you know, sort of what makes a great, a, a good leader or, you know, what sort of the philosophy is that's optimal. It probably varies by person to some degree. I think independence is very important. I think forcing yourself to speak up for what you think is, is right is very important. I think taking as many bullets as you can for your team and your firm and your assistant U.S. attorneys and your staff attorneys is very important, leading by example. I do tell the story, because I've said before, taking all the bullets you can is an important trait of leadership. When you go to Washington, you begin to feel the air flowing through you as you've taken, you know, like 4,000 <laughs> of those bullets. So you wonder how long that will, you know, you'll be able to take the next 12. Uh, but I do think that's very important. And I think it's, and so it's very interesting what you said be, about training leadership, because because yeah, again, I've been asked before, well, what makes you able to sort of, you know, take all these barbs and arrows? And, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. Skin that's how many, how many inches thick? Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, a, it's a bit, I mean, because I don't think it's that hard to figure out. It, sometimes it is. I don't mean that there aren't excruciating decisions to make all the time. But it's kind of the right thing to do. You know, how hard is it to figure out what you think the right thing to do is? I've never found that, I don't think that hard. Maybe that's a problem, I don't know. But I also... You know, you you know you're going to get hit in the head for it from whatever you know quarter you're in. How do you sort of train people to say you know stick stick to that you know? But anyway, that you were saying you so I don't know if you can train leadership. So you you should you but but basically you're teaching leadership yeah. here in a way that's is terrific. Yeah, it's teachable. Yeah, and in business schools have known yeah. this for yeah. a long time. Yeah. And um, you know there are there are ways of thinking about leadership in the legal context. And so really, it's been part of what Columbia has been. Um, it's, you know, a couple of years ago, we, we decided, you know what, we can do this in a way that, that uh, allows our students to apply leadership principles to concrete examples of things that they'll be asked to do once they become yeah. lawyers. And, um, and we, it's very experiential. It's a lot of hands-on learning, a lot of problem-based learning. 
we have a couple of upper year courses, but we also have a module when they come in orientation, just yeah. to introduce them in August of their 1L year. You know what? Leadership is going to be a thing we talk about a lot over the next three years. And let's introduce you to this by that's great. doing some exercises. Uh, we'll break out into groups and we'll do some so, exercises. You know, that, so that's foreign Get to 1974, about right? This. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's a, I that's mean, a, legal method, right, is what I think we got, yeah. right, in August. So, so that would, which is yeah. good, but, you know. Uh, we still have legal method. Yeah, no, 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 uh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, a, it's that's invaluable. That's still a signature but, you know, course. A, you know, uh, um, no, but seriously, that's very exciting. It's important. And, you know, I guess more generally, you know, Great committed faculty who uh, who see who don't see students students as fungible who who are committed to forming relationships and modeling the kind of uh, leadership that our students ultimately will uh, will will themselves be able to perform in their own mentoring and their own uh, uh, conduct within an organization and and you know this may may seem like it has a little to do with the specifics of leadership but also um, bringing any student who's got the talent and the drive to Columbia, no matter what their financial means. You know, it's bringing it's huge. A, yeah. a, a, a really yeah. broad, eclectic, very experientially uh, varied group of, of students to Columbia and having them experience each other for three years. And so financial aid has been a huge piece of, yeah. uh, it, it seems like, well, how many steps removed is that? But I actually want to say it's, it's very, very intentionally <laughs> Uh, part of the mission of creating leaders of the next generation, of bringing people here to Columbia, bringing them together, giving them committed faculty, building a curriculum that allows them to hone those skills. And um, very yeah. impressive. So yeah. actually, right. to come right. full circle to the very beginning of the conversation, I mean, the, the, the campaign, the gifts that the, our alumni have given to the school have allowed us to, you know, to spearhead these innovative initiatives and to keep the school really operating uh, to produce the top the top professionals of the next generation. So people Great. that will emulate the kind of career you've had, Mary Jo. So. I wouldn't go that far. From, you know. <laughs> you haven't um, asked me if I want I'm, to do it again I'm, the same way. I'm yeah, just, right? if you won't say it, I'm going to say <laughs> okay, it. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Mary Jo, for uh, no, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Uh, I'd love to open, open it up. Uh, Mr. Smith. Oh, and you got to push it till it's green, till it lights up. Or maybe it's red. Yes, I think it's working now. We didn't have this in 1984. <laughs> no, 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 not even close. You know, the technology guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm the IT guy for him. Might have been the wrong one to pick, right? <laughs> Yeah, depending on the day, either two of the top five or top six companies in the world measured by market cap have a governance structure that I think was would have been regarded as very unusual a generation ago. Namely, they have these two tiers of stock so that they're public, but you have either one, two, or three individuals that are able to, in effect, make all the decisions that are made by shareholders, including the election of directors. So you have CEOs who report to a board, but it is a board that in effect is elected by the CEO. How should we think about that? Is that good or bad for capitalism and the way we've thought about the role of agencies like the SEC? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I certainly took care at the SEC not to be, because I don't think it's the right, the, the proper role for the SEC to be prescriptive about that. However, um, that is troublesome to me, uh, you know, that you've got that kind of concentration. But I think what's happened in the, you know, the greater corporate governance world for, you know, large and medium size and other size corporations is that, you know, you've basically gotten to the point where where's the line between the board and management and where do the activists fit in and how, how responsive do you have to be to them? And then you sort of come to the point of saying, I'm not running this business. I mean, I'm not running this business for shareholder value you know, or myself, um, but, um, you know, but when it's that concentrated, you know, I worry about the transparency issues and I worry about, um, you know, how badly a riot could go on, you know, any number of things, I think. But, but what's your, I mean, may I ask, I mean, I'm not what's your view, Brad, seriously? I, th I think it's bad. Yeah. 
uh, you know, I just think that ultimately large institutions to survive a long period of time do best if they can be decisive but subject to some level of checks and balances. Yeah. And I think that it's interestingly, you know, the two companies yeah. are Google and Facebook. Right, right, right. The number one check at one of them is the employees. Yeah. And the number one check on the other, or perhaps both, will be regulators outside of corporate governance issues. Right. Um, but it just loses a lot of what yeah, you no, typically I, I don't disagree to. with that. I mean, my speech that I nearly got shot at in Silicon Valley, I was mentioning before. One of the hooks that led me to be able to talk about that were, frankly, the employees as shareholders. You know, they weren't shareholders in a public company, but how they were being treated, you know, kind of in the various tiers of raising capital and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I agree with you. I agree with you. Ms. White. Okay. Gentlemen in the front. Hi, how are you? Good to Hi. see you. That's so, why I my glasses on so I can recognize you. So okay. if we think today about an internal investigation yeah. of a CEO, the name that comes to mind is Robert Mueller. And I don't want to ask you any ultimate conclusion kind sure of questions. Do, but <laughs> no, but I don't, I don't, for various <laughs> reasons, for re the various so reasons, I don't tomorrow. think that's appropriate. But I am <laughs> curious about what you think of his Reluctance to testify. Oh boy, um, that's a. T I mean, first I know Bob Mueller. Uh, you know, I'm among as you know you would even where I've been, I would know him, and I do, and I have, like I think, if if not 100 percent, 99 percent of people who have ever known him, you know, just utmost respect for him, his integrity, his ability to investigate, uh, his apoliticalness. Um, but I have to say, I think, um, you know, you think, you know, you can't help but sort of put yourself in, what would you do if I had been the Bob Mueller kind of thing? And I know why he doesn't want to testify. Because he, for all those qualities I just mentioned, he doesn't want to become a political pawn of both sides, which he would be, as you know, he already is, even having said five minutes of here's what I meant or whatever, but the report says what I meant. Uh, but I think you need to testify. I mean, you know, I just think it's too too important, um, you know, an issue. He could handle himself just fine. I mean, somebody was telling me the other day, it must have been the worst part of your experience to testify in Congress. I said, actually not, <laughs> because typically you know more than, I mean, you right. better know more than people who are asking you questions, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, and you know, you know the trick in the House Financial Services Committee, Senate's a little better, but not much, um, is a very smart staffer gives them a question that's a good question and then you answer and they're stuck they can, you know, they could not ask you that second question if their life depended on it right um, so I don't, I don't I don't mean to turn facetious on this serious subject but it's a so but he can handle himself and you know I think he I think what he would do and I think you've heard people say this probably is that he really would try to stick to that report you know my report is all I have to say about this, other than what I said the other day to clarify, you know, some confusion and misinterpretation. So I think he wants to avoid, you know, all the spin and counter spin, which I get, frankly, because then it's, you know, another nine years of everybody saying what he said and he meant and all those things. But I still think you need to have some the public light of day. Yes, up, up there. Uh, you not. I don't know your name, but uh, yes, you. <laughs> yes, me. Hey, Talcott Camp got a JD in 1994. Just wanted to say thank you so much for the kinds of changes you've talked about since uh, 1974. Obviously, you produced brilliant graduates in 74, <laughs> but um, when I came in 1992, I was here for the arrival of the first Dean of Public Interest Initiatives, Ellen Chapnick. Um, and so I got to take advantage of, you know, uh, semester internships in the public interest and um, summer internships in the public interest and the loan repayment assistance for people who went into public interest law. I'm, I have been at the ACLU for over 20 years and most of the national, at the national office and most of the lawyers at the ACLU national office are in New York. So we greatly appreciate the ability to recruit students and graduates from Columbia who take advantage of those programs. So thank you so much. Please keep supporting your public interest students. Thank you for the for the shout out. Um, <laughs> in, in yeah, over the over these three years, 
uh, this year, next year, and the following year, uh, I've committed to investing an additional $4 million in uh, public interest and public service programs. Yeah, all right. Uh, so uh, it's, a big, it's been a big priority. It's been a big priority. So the questions. Yes. Um, Mary Jo, can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, in, in the 45 years since we graduated in, uh, in I the recognize your voice. Sorry, wave, wave your hand. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> you, you remember me. I, of course I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jim Kaplan. No, no, I don't. Uh, I'd be interested in your views on the structure of the New York legal market and how it's changed and whether that's a good it's changed for the better or the worse. Uh, you've, I guess, primarily been in the private sector with large firms. But I'd be interested in your views as to how it's changed over the years. Um, yeah, I, and I, you know, I, look, obviously I've, as I mentioned, been to Dev Voice six times. And I've thought many, many times, in addition to going into government service, you know, where your heart kind of is, I think, uh, you know, even though I love private practice, about doing a different, you know, so, so working somewhere else in the legal, private legal structure, setting up my own firm, public interest firm, different kind. You know, I always sort of stop short because I found and do find to this day, literally, um, private practice at, you know, at a large firm, given the nature of the problems that I get to deal with, just really challenging and satisfying. Um, and the way I sort of handle the uh, sort of other aspects of my personality is I go back into the government every so often for, uh, for 10 years at a time or whatever it may be. Um, but I think the diversification, so I like the big firm. I don't have to, you know, order the conference room table or, you know, I mean, I can just work uh, on, on my matter. So I sort of like that structure. I think the, the clients have become much more empowered, both in terms of fees, obviously, in terms of, you know, I'm not going to just use you, uh, you know, forever, the same law firm I've used forever. The law firms aren't thrilled with all of that, but it's a good thing and it's a healthy thing, I think, for the, for the marketplace. One of the other changes in the legal market that I think has been terrific, frankly, when, when I was a, a, an associate, not at Deborah Voice, because Deborah Voice had actually had, you know, partners or ways, ways back who'd actually gone to the U.S. Attorney's Office and so forth. But a lot of the big firms wouldn't really let you leave and come back because they thought you, you know, basically, you know, learn bad habits, you know, in the government, you know, so you can, <laughs> so, um, you know, um, so that's changed, right? And, and obviously, the, there's much more flexibility in the marketplace for going in and out of you know public service and uh, and into the private sector. Uh, I always say to people too, and I really mean this, even though I've essentially you know been at Devoy six times and then you know, a couple of significant government stints. You know, you've got 45 years, and literally that's what I say. Now I've had 45 years, but you have 45 or 50 years or more to be a lawyer. And boy, if you only do one thing or work one place. I mean, that's depressing, right? I mean, I mean, I, and this is this is not anti deborah voice, mind you. But when I became a partner, I would have been more depressed if I hadn't become a partner uh, the first time I became a partner. <laughs> Let me make that perfectly clear. Uh, but I wouldn't come out of my office for two days. I was so depressed that my life was over. I was thirty-four years old, or however old I was, right? And so, you know, I think it's easier today to grab more slices of legal life. You know, I think the law schools are doing a tremendous service by what you've been describing, you know, that, that don't have you sort of, I mean, I used to say, this is why I'm also not invited back, that Columbia, to some degree, and I love the law school, and I'm grateful, as I said earlier, but a bit programmed, you know, to do what I at least did initially, and a lot of us did initially, which was to clerk, and I even fought that for a while, but then I saw the light, great job, um, and then go into one of these firms, and if you're good, you become a partner, and that's what you do. Uh, and, you know, you yourself could say, no, there's more to legal life than this. But, but the help you're giving people to do that now, I think, is just a tremendously positive change. So that's probably not responsive to what you really are asking me. But that's well, I think I'm, what I'm more questioning is, yeah. would you say that the current system perpetuates the inequality in the society? Both oh, in law I firms and elsewhere? Everything perpetuates the... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I, I don't mean that in a, in a facetious way. I mean... But what do you what do you mean? You should you should tell. Yeah, what do you mean? Well, I, I think the system of large firms has kind of gotten out of control with the uh, the compensation system of people making millions of dollars in the law. How many it's dollars? Kind of are you? Millions of uh, <laughs> millions of I'm dollars hoping. in the. Uh, I, I think it's sort of lost. I know uh, what you mean. 
it's it's lost its base with the vast vast a uh, number of uh, people who really need legal services in this society. At least that's my perspective. No, I, no, look, I agree with that, although I don't know that I put as much onus, maybe I wouldn't, right, because I've been in a large firm. I mean, you know, I think, and I speak from Dev Voice, but I know other firms too. I mean, if you if you look at the commitment to pro bono, and it's not just, gee, the young associates can get, you know, good training there and they can't work on the paying matters because the clients won't let them. I mean, there's a real... I think growing, I mean, certainly compared to 1974 to today, the commitment of the big firms to serious pro bono, I think, has really grown tremendously. Uh, and I also think that you have more and more lawyers actually going into, not, not just in the public sector, but also in the public sector, you know, areas where you're servicing people uh, and helping people who can't afford to pay, you know, the fees of the big firms. But it's certainly not the case that every great lawyer is in a large firm. Uh, so I think, Jim, it's, it's, it's improved since we were, uh, we were here. Tremendous. I'm not saying it's solved by any means. Well, usually I'm not accused of greater optimism, but, but I might, I might, okay. Time for one more question. Uh, way in the back. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, hi. Um, my name's Yola Nicholson and it's, Great pleasure that I see Evan Davis, who actually mentored me on a lot of pro bono work. So um, I hope that was a, a treat. Um, I'm a 1989 grad, and I sort of wanted to follow. My, my, my question might be a little complicated, but I'm going to try to keep it simple. Um, I had the opportunity to work in the capital markets, and now I do um, foreclosure prevention work. You mentioned that, and we know from your record that you are the SEC at the at the height of the financial crisis and the bailout. And the bailout, um, in my view, but I might not be invited back for that view, sort of facilitated a non-transparent market that traded in mortgage-backed securities and um, you know, even during the meltdown. Um, and to use your term, we sort of subsidized big, right? Because the government bailed them out. But what, we've, what we now have is a continued sort of re restructured RMBS distressed asset loan market that's really actually wreaking havoc on Main Street and it remains unregulated. Nobody knows who these investors are. These investors are, you know, this quite quiet hedge fund market. Do you think that that should continue being unregulated or if you think not, where should that regulation be placed? Is it at the SEC? Is it, because it's it, it affects such an important component of our society, which is home ownership. Yeah, no, no question about that. I don't know that the SEC is, it depends on what aspect of that we're talking about as to whether I think it should be housed at the SEC. I mean, certainly to the extent there's securitization in that space, there's room, there, there could be room for expansion, you know, of SEC oversight. I mean, I guess I would make a more, um, maybe more general comment to some degree. I mean, one is the bailouts, obviously lots of people hated the bailouts. I mean, I, I but I do think you, have a fair consensus that uh, if you had not done that, the damage on Main Street and to investors and homeowners would have you know, been catastrophically worse. I mean, so one has to figure that part out, but that's only sort of the first part and one can have different views on that. And then what's, then what, right? How did we get here? We never want to do this again, too big to fail, all those you know, kinds of concepts. And that's what Dodd-Frank was a lot you know, about basically. And, and so, you know, part of, or parts of Dodd Frank were about, about that, uh, important parts of that, and including, uh, you know, in the the mortgage backed you know markets and the transparency. A lot of those mandated rules and not mandated rules when I was chairman of the SEC were about you know creating that greater transparency. And you know, anytime you get into a, I don't know if it's any time because I'm not sure precisely what I what era I would compare this to, but there are real downsides to deregulatory you know, philosophies. I mean, so, you know, now we're, we're described as being in, you know, the CFPB, for example, uh, which I think did maybe went overboard in some ways, but it did a lot of good too for, you know, Main Street and, and customers. It's, it's really been, you know, gutted, basically. Um, and so I think that's very dangerous. And, and I, don't, I don't like the idea of having to kind of count on the pendulum. Okay, we'll get another group in, you know, the Democrats will come back and then we'll go and we'll just regulate, regulate. You know, you, you want to be doing it all the time. And what I said to the, I remember right after the election, which surprised everyone, I guess, I had a, happened to have a meeting with uh, 
um, it's, 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 a, it's a business roundtable group of CEOs, actually, who um, were surprised, like everybody else, that it happened. It happened. And, and, you know, my, and I was chairman of the SEC, and I said, you know, this is really the time for the private sector to step up to the plate here. Because, I mean, particularly if you're going to get into an era where, you know, the regulations that are there to protect the consumers, you know, and the investors are, you know, are going to be diluted if they are. Or if you roll back all of the, you know, financial stability safeguards, very bad idea. You know, you really need the private sector to sort of step up to the plate to show you kind of don't need that what you consider to be excessive regulation, you know, by saying, okay, now we can do whatever we want to do out here. So, so I think there's a need for more regulation in that space. I mean, just my wandering answer. Uh, but I think you want to always regulate smartly, right? Smartly. Please join me in thanking Mary Jo Lyons. Thank you.